Okay. Everyone can hear me. I'm going to be the first fool to get up here and ask the question. I understand what you're trying to do here, and, and of course I'm loving the forest and everything, but I see the city of Gainesville and all the available properties from the sheriff's office out here. You know, the signs are just rotten and they're falling down. They've been for sale for so long. We have a lot of commercial properties, a lot of residential properties in Hawthorne that can be developed and save our forest because I, I, I play them not into using them. We've been here 4.6 billion years. If you convert that down to 46 years, uh, we've been here for four hours and our industrial revolution has happened in the last minute and we've used 50% of our forest. So I'm concerned about our forest. So uh, I'm wondering why we're not building those cities and improving those in the city. And why we would want to, why we would want to uh, actually develop a, a rural forest area that's been that way for you know a long time. And I, I can't understand it. So if anybody could answer that for me, I would appreciate that. Sure, thank you. Alex. My name is Tim Jackson. I've been on three. The answer to that question is it's not about it's not about build new out here and don't build in the city. This plan looks at let's do both of those things because we think there are opportunities we can't capture on the land that's already urban. They're not large enough tracts of land that are adjacent to the railroad to put in the track larger boilers. That's the that's the concept. Um, Dr. Denslow looked at the opportunities and said, in fact, if we, the county, you, the county, decide on a different future than the trend of 1% or slow growth of jobs, and said, we want to actually attract more jobs here, a different kind than we attract by partnering with the University of Florida, we could do that if we made large tracts of land available. So that's what this, that's the concept behind this plan. question about the water usage um, and the conservation and the environment protection and all that sort of thing. And there was a, uh, there was a lot of talk in Alaska County about springs protection and, and uh, restoration and all that. And there was a, a springs bill that was proposed that um, was, de well, it died. It, it was uh, defeated basically. And Plum Creek signed this letter in opposition to that bill. And I'm just curious about that. And, I mean, there's so many water issues, like, uh, there's a, a study, Bulletin uh, 69, that came out in 2007, which was revised in 2011, that shows how the freshwater lens that we all take our water from is shrinking, and the old salty water is coming up, and I just don't know how you can justify your water requests, potentially, and how can you, how can you even say all these things when you're not going to build anything anyway, it's just, it's very confusing. Thank you. Thank you. I need to clarify. Plum Creek did not sign that letter in opposition to the Springs Bill. What you have is a letter. What you have is a letter that was drafted by the attorney that put our name on there without consulting us or asking us. And the official, the official letter deletes deletes our name and deletes one other party that were put on that letter in error by the attorney. That's the truth. That just happens to be the truth. In terms of water withdrawal, there's a couple a couple ways to, to, to look at that. One is um, Commissioner Byerly showed the county, the, the big countywide map, and showed there aren't wetlands on the west side, there are wetlands on the east side. Right? That's because the east, the west side, that is the recharge area for the aquifer. The water that falls there, as you said, goes into the ground, goes to the aquifer. The water that falls on the east side becomes surface water, it flows through the creeks, and it flows to the lakes. So in, that's just one of the, that's just geology of the county. The, the, the water usage, 
the water usage question is we have proposed that new jobs and new people are going to use water here. Wherever they come, whoever comes here, they're going to use water. We're proposing, we're proposing as a part of this um, set of policies is that, that we would, this new development would use, would put in place policies that use less than half of the average water use of other kinds of development here. So it would, it would create an example of how we can all use less water for our daily use than we really need to. So it says we will not use drinking water for irrigation in the residential areas, for example. It says that the reused water, the reclaimed water, the first priority to use the water that comes out of the wastewater treatment plant, the first priority is to go into the natural systems to make sure the creeks, the wetlands have enough water. And then second, the water would be used for agriculture or for industry. So that those are, that's the, the idea is that this creates a way we could all live differently. For example, it requires that all the landscaping be Florida friendly, which needs a lot less water. So that if all of us that already live here in this state were to practice just like that, our water usage in the whole state would actually go down because we all use a lot less water. That's the goal here, to set this example. And the way to do it, or the only people who can do it, is somebody who has this many acres of land and wants to do it. If Plum Creek can bring this kind of commerce into our county and knock down our forests and, and mess with our environment, why can't our own county step up and do it for us without involving outsiders and the destruction of what we actually here were raised in in these forests to hunt and, and live with? Let, let's go to the, the, is Plum Creek going to create these jobs? And the answer is no, that's not. Right, we're not creating the jobs. Plum Creek, what? Right. Okay, let's, let's go back to the, to, the, to the set of questions. One is, is the, the basis of making of this plan is that we make a significant additional lands available for economic development for major jobs in return for significant additional lands going into conservation. That you do those two things. That's what this plan does. And Dr. I mean Dr. Denslow's forecast is this county could could attract those new jobs here if the county chose to do that. That's it. Let me answer the question. Would you do? Could I do that, please? Thank you very much. So that, that it could. If the land isn't made available, it's not going to happen. So the Plum Creek is an answer because we all we own sixty thousand acres. We can we can provide significant protection of natural resources in return for making that additional land available for economic opportunities. We can do that because we own sixty thousand acres. Anybody else, if they only owned a few acres for the manufacturing site, you, the community wouldn't be able to get that land into conservation. So that's the role of Plum Creek in this, was a whole two years of listening, saying what we think we need in our community is a place for these major new jobs, and we need land into conservation. As an owner of 60,000 acres, we have the ability to accommodate that, that part of the plan. So the other things we're doing, to attract those jobs, number one, as Rose talked about, is we have funded and we are out there in the recruitment mode of major employers, working with the University of Florida, working with Santa Fe. So we're not we're not sitting back and saying, approve this land and people are going to move here. We're actually out there doing doing that initiative, that economic progress initiative with the community. And Dale Will can talk about at length about exactly what we're doing there. The second part of that question, I think, was, so what's Plum Creek's role? We, our intention as Plum Creek is to be the master developer of this land. 
That means we intend to get to have the commission hopefully approve the comprehensive plan of the amendment. We intend to go get that land zone a piece at a time, a large piece at a time. Probably we talk about A, B, C, D to do those one at a time to get it zoned to then go through a master plan for each of those specific areas where we say where are the roads, where's the stormwater, where does the mixed use center go, where does the commercial go, where do the homes go, what sizes are they, and then to partner with a developer who builds vertically, who builds buildings. We don't build buildings. That's our intent. Now there's nothing, I want to make sure, there's nothing in this plan that requires us to do that. When if we, after this is approved or even before this is approved, we can sell this land to anyone else. The requirements of this plan go with the land. The requirements aren't on Plum Creek. The requirements go with the land. So if the commission approves this proposal, approves this complaint amendment, then those requirements stay with the land. Um, it's not, not Plum Creek. Okay, I kind of make one request that we keep our, uh, our questions directly to the uh, committee and uh, keep our comments to a minimum. If we have comments, let's write them on our... Uh, Why? Okay, that's a big question. I'll try to be succinct. Um, I believe 
you're assuming in your question that Plum Creek is going to do those things. And I think that's what needs to be discussed. Because it's not clear at all to myself. And we, we kind of, I'm definitely not running the show, but I'm going to answer your question. Um, and just in the interest of, of everyone, I, I know everyone's kind of fired up about this, but the less booing and hand clapping there is, the more people will feel open to express their views, and we can disagree in nice civil meetings, so I hope we can do that. Um, your assumption is that Plum Creek is going to improve economic prosperity in eastern part of the county. I dispute that. I think what they do is they zone land, upzone it, and sell it. It will be sold in pieces to different developers who may or may not do things. But there's nothing that could come or could happen now that isn't already in place. If an employer wants to come to Alachua County and do the things you're talking about, they can. There's not a lack of properly zoned land. There's not a lack of opportunity to do the things that they're promising to do. Now, I haven't heard anything about educational opportunities. I'm not sure what that refers to. I'm not sure how basically developing land and selling it is going to improve educational opportunities. But in my opinion, the jobs that are being promised here are jobs that could happen already and are probably going to happen around the county and other places as well. You're right. Some of this is where? That's an important question. Again, either I or my group oppose all that is being proposed to to the city of Hawthorne, which is where the economic opportunity part of this seems to be. The part we object to and are concerned about is all of this area over here, which is primarily, I'm answering your question the best I can. Uh, you're asking about economic opportunity and educational access, and what I'm telling you is that the part that might offer that opportunity, we do not oppose. The part we oppose is the primarily suburban, sprawling residential that will be on this larger area out here, which is not going to create the economic opportunity that you're talking about. They get built, probably by someone out of state, maybe someone local, but then they're gone. They're done and they're gone. So that kind of development is not going to help anyone, particularly in the long term. What we're going to be left with is a lot of problems that all the taxpayers are going to have to deal with. Um, I'd like to very quickly respond to two points that I heard earlier, and then I'll turn the microphone over. I want to make sure that everyone understands there's nothing in the county law or code, certainly the state wouldn't allow us, that can prohibit us from people planting grass in their yard and walking. A lot of what I've heard offers a very optimistic, shiny vision of things, and we're debating that vision, but to bring it back down to reality, we can't prohibit people from planting grass in their yards and watering. Possibly a homeowners association could be, but that would be a majority vote, a private matter, and not many homeowners associations are going to prohibit grass. Secondly, uh, the statement that the rights and the restrictions go with the land is accurate but misleading. Unless there's a permanent conservation easement on some part of it, anything that is approved at this first step or at the later step could be changed at any time in the future by any future county commission. If they want to spend the money, they come back to the county commission to ask for changes to the plan. None of this is carved in stone. And if someone buys a 5,000 acre parcel of this 10, 15, 20 years from now and wants to do something different, they're going to come ask for changes. And on what basis is the county commission going to do? I'm always amazed at what I learned that we're doing that we're not doing and that uh, folks talk about us. Just to answer the quick question that Ms. Gorsi had brought up, is anybody else funding economic opportunity in this county? And I'm going to say no. Um, Plum Creek is funding the economic <coughs> progress plan for the entire county. There's been some initiatives that have happened through the Council of Economic Outreach where there's been the consortium of members who have pulled that together and they've been able to fund some of the efforts, but not to the extent that we're funding it. Have they facilitated the conversations to bring folks together about what can we do to improve the education system in order to make sure that folks not only are aware of the jobs that are coming, but the education is aligned with it and they're receiving the appropriate training? And the answer is no. Those are some of the things that we've been facilitating. We've been working through the Chamber of Commerce and they've been, uh, started their initiative called Innovation Gainesville, which set the whole framework for it. And by the way, uh, Pastor Adrian Taylor is here. He's the Vice President of IG as well. And so he can let you know. The other thing that I'd like to do is probably have Dale talk a little bit about it because Dale, Dr. Dale Brill is obviously 
uh, the former secretary of the Office of Tourism, Trade, and Economic Development. There's very few in the state that really understand economic development, and he could probably answer that question too. Has anybody really done something like this where not only have they put a land use plan in place, but they're also making sure that it's being funded with the economic development side as well as the education side? Thank you, Rosa, and thank you all for uh, letting somebody come in from out of town and be part of the discussion. Uh, this is an honor to democracy, and it just, it's, it's neat to watch this happen. Uh, obviously, I'm employed by Punk Creek and have some opinions of this uh, from a state perspective. I'll have you all know that the eyes of the state are upon you, uh, because fundamentally the question you're wrestling with is that must we choose between the environment and job creation? I'm hoping that your answer will be no, that that's a false dichotomy, that's a false choice that the green uh, that sometimes represents the environment, the color green that represents money uh, and uh, profit, uh, the, the question of where will education come from. Education costs money. The state of Florida has been um, pulling from various administrations the education budgets across the entire state. So this is a little experiment, and I, I bring a state perspective and will tell you that uh, no, not only in the state of Florida is this not happening, uh, it, this kind of commitment and this kind of uh, discussion and possibility doesn't exist in the United States. Uh, you'll hear people talk about Silicon Valley, you'll hear people talk about Boston, you'll hear people talk about Austin, Texas. A couple of reactions to that I want you to think about. If, if, if we all wanted to be like Austin, Texas, we'd move to Austin, Texas. And, 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 but we can create jobs that are your flavor of jobs. Um, to the question about economic development, I, I, another part where it's a false choice is that, that will they sell this off um, and, and look at what corporations do. And are there any uh, sheep, farm raisers, any uh, cattle, that type of thing? Uh, the phrase that my dad always taught me is that you can shear a sheep a thousand times, you can only skin it once. And, and the, the, the business model that's built into this, and we're going we're to talk about business, the business model that's built into this is how to maximize the benefit of all the people in the exchange of what's happening here. Uh, the other last thing I'll leave you with, and, and Rose will speak to um, with the perspective, is Again, it's about business, and you hear business people talk about it's all about the bottom line. Business people are always associated about the bottom line, and again, that's the choice. It's a false choice. What if there were a triple bottom line? Think about it, a triple bottom line. That would be a fundamentally different thing not only in the state of Florida, in the state of, uh, in the entire country. And the triple bottom line is this. There's a bottom line that involves economic development, and will wealth be created for people who live in an area? There's a triple bottom line. The second bottom line is will there be social equity? Will there be opportunity for people regardless of what color they chase or what color their skin is? And there's a third bottom line, which is will we take care of our environment? And the, the new model of economic development that is before you is to reject the either or and to find a way to do all three. We manage it with forestry. We're a forestry company. This is a marriage. We're going to be here for a while. This is our land. So, and I actually live in the world. Thank you. I want to try and get my three questions in before you try to answer that question. I didn't get any of that. You didn't answer their question. In Windsor, that's a nice community small town, not even a gas station. That's why I live out there. You want to, I, I think that's wonderful that you want to develop Hawthorne. That's great. That's wonderful. I shop here and I come here at least once or twice a week. Why Windsor? Why 10,500 dwelling units around where I live in the country? That many people eventually did you your plan? Maybe my great grandchildren. What's going to happen to my water? As he showed you, the brown, the blue, all over the, I'm not just talking to you, I'm talking to all of you. You start putting sidewalks and houses and all of that. What's that going to do to the aquifer? What's that going to do to my well? Is that going to flood my property once you start building on that? Try to answer in that order. The, the last question was, is that going to flood your property? Uh, the answer to that is no, there are rules and regulations that don't allow development on a piece of land to flow water off of it in excess of what's already flowed off that property, that land today. So the answer is no. You're going to displace the water. So, so, we're going to, so on, on this land, if it's developed, 
we will store the water on this land so that it doesn't flood any land off it. That's one of those. That doesn't replenish my aquifer. The, the, um, so the second question was about the land and so the, the wetlands. So let me just give some numbers. The, the 60,000 acres has about 30% wetlands. The, the, the map that the commissioner showed, our 60,000 acres, about one in three acres, about 30% are wetlands. The purple land, the potential, the land where we could potentially put development is, is right at 18% wetlands. So it has less wetland than the overall of the 60,000 acres. And it's that wetlands, those wetlands, plus the buffers around it, that we would work around to develop something. Um, on, the, on the land that's not already in conservation, so the 37,000 acres that we own, that doesn't have a conservation easement on it, there are about 12,000 acres of wetland on there. We have looked at concepts on the purple to develop a job center, some manufacturing in Hawthorne, and associated residential around it. We've looked at some concepts and started to look at so how much how many acres of wetland might that actually involve filling. So we've looked at we've looked at a set of concepts and we're we've said, look, some of those are in the you know a dozen or so acres of wetland that get filled, others maybe two, two hundred and fifty acres of wetland at the upset limit. So that's kind of the range of discussion we've been having about potentially filling some of those wetlands. That's about 2% of all the wetlands that are in that 37,000 acres. So that doesn't mean, there's in the plan, it doesn't say this is, we're going to impact wetlands. What the plan says is, is we're asking the county to provide the flexibility for us to ask the commission in zoning to fill some wetlands because we think there are some potential positive benefits to that. That filling some of those wetlands lets us do a more compact job center so we get more density and we can preserve lands other places. We can preserve more uplands outside those wetlands. So this plan asks for that flexibility to go to the commission and ask them for that permission to detail specific area plan and zoning. So that's trying to answer your question. Thank you. Uh, I just want to quickly point out uh, everything that he said is true if we grant them all the development rights that they're asking for. Thank you. It might make sense if we grant them the areas that they want to have an excuse. There are certainly some benefits to clustering. Clustering is already required in many ways by the Elijah County Comprehensive Plan. I don't know how much more is being gained. Um, uh, the other part was about wetlands. I think I don't know what I was going to say. Um, Hi, my name is Sally Chesron. I have just a brief observation and then a question. Uh, listening to the conversation tonight from the audience, it seems one of the major issues is that of trust and mistrust. And um, I wonder if anybody, since Mr. Meyerly has pointed out that in that purple around Hawthorne, Palm Creek already has all the development rights it would need to bring economic opportunity, educational benefits, and other, other benefits to this community. So the question is, why would you not maybe consider starting with this area, showing what a great thing you can do, and then you have some data that said, this is what we do. We can, this with Roxy's many jobs, we did it with this little impact, and then the trust would grow. But I don't see it growing anymore, folks. I just don't see it growing. Yeah. Thank you. First, the land that we, the, the purple land up there, we, we don't have the right to develop as industrial today. It is rural agriculture just like the rest of that land. So we don't have that ability now. But your, your thought that start, start small and then grow is something to, certainly something to think about as we get into discussions with the commission. The, the, the scale of conservation that can happen in return for urban development is, is where that would miss. 
The, the sector plan requires 15,000 acres minimum to do the sector plan. So that's the reason, the reason that the whole proposal is on the table is because we're trying to think really big about the environmental get and think really big about the land use of food. He's right. Uh, that part of it doesn't have development approval. My statement was that I personally, based upon what I have done so far, is that there's a lot of merit to that piece of it. And the group stand by our plan has taken the position that that is something the county commission should consider that piece of it. Um, remember what I was going to say. I wanted to point out uh, that the difference between the existing wetland protections in the Natural County Comprehensive Plan and what Plum can be proposing. They want to basically set aside the county's wetland protections and replace them with the state federal process. The county guidelines are a lot more stringent. Uh, essentially, the state federal guidelines do not recognize wetlands under a quarter acre. Is that correct? Looking at my growth management staff. You can bulldoze in a period of the amount that exists. I don't know if those are included in the calculations in Plum Creek. The 18% figure, I don't know if that included the buffers, or if that's just the wetlands. They do not include buffers. And that probably also don't include the land that's within the 100 year theme of flood plain. Okay. When you start doing those things, that number is going to change. It's also important to understand we won't really know the exact number until you get out there and walk the land. At this point, it's somewhat conceptual. All we really know is it's really, really wet. The other thing that the state federal guidelines would allow is essentially for eight wetlands larger than a quarter acre, you can destroy them too, but you have to mitigate. And what that means, wetland mitigation means, you can destroy this wetland as long as you essentially dig a hole that holds the same amount of water somewhere else. It works pretty well in terms of engineering the water flow. It works terribly if you're trying to recreate the biological and ecological functions of a wetland. We have a very poor track record in the state of reproducing those functions through wetland mitigation. We don't know what the final tally will be because the wetlands that will be asked to be set to destroy or change comes at a later approval stage. It doesn't happen at this stage of the process. It happens after the county commission has already said, yes, you can develop. So again, the details we need to decide whether or not this is a good plan come later in the process. They don't come up with it at the end. Thanks, Scott. So the question was that there were two two questions. One was in in the development area, how will we control flooding? And the second was on the lands that are conservation easement areas, do we clear cut the forest? Those are the two questions, right? So I can handle the first question. The second one, we have some people who know exactly what we do in our forestry practice. So um, to to address. They're looking at saying which one does? Okay. In the in the in the flooding, in the flooding, in, in development to, to address flooding, we have a stormwater management system that holds water, that retains it, detains it. Um, it detains it so that it keeps the same amount of water flowing off that land as was flowing off it before it was developed. It re right, it, it retains it and detains it, does those two things. But also at, at that time, it's treating the uh, whatever it has gotten into it. If it came off of the roadway, it might have some. It has some um, minerals in it. Or it came off of, of as we do today in, in areas where if you if you put on fertilizer, you'd be treating out the phosphorus that came on. Right? So um, the way that you control the flooding is by a stormwater system. It's not by ditching like agricultural activities. Okay. You want to address the, on the conservation lands, what are the, the forestry practices of cutting and how big a tract gets cut at one time and all those kinds of things? Is that what you're asking? Scott? Uh, okay, do we clear cut conservation land? Um, I'm Brett Tushak, I'm the resource supervisor in charge of harvesting and marketing operations here in Gainesville. Um, 
we do clear cut our conservation lands, but those lands are then planted back and brought back into forest management. Thank you for the question. I think it's important for everyone to understand what Plum Creek means when they say conservation. Most of us think about the woods. They can nice crawl through the woods. There's wildlife all around. It's not faulting them. This is just what they do. They're a timber company. They, they grow trees. This is intensive industrial agriculture, essentially. They grow trees on a relatively short rotation. They till the ground. They clear cut rows of pine trees, relatively dense. They may do a thinning operation, but they grow pine trees. That's what they do. Biologically, it's more akin to a, a cornfield than it is to a conservation forest. Again, it's not a fault, it's just a fact. I think you need to be aware of that. When we're talking about 87% being put into conservation, you're talking about 80 to 7% agriculture, not woodlands for people to enjoy. And secondly, about the stormwater part, we've been talking about wetlands being destroyed, but a very, very important part of this is the extent to which existing wetlands will be incorporated into the stormwater system. You're allowed to discharge waters into contained wetlands. It happens right now all the time. A pond, a creek, part of that runoff is going to happen in other areas, and it may not destroy them, but it will significantly alter the flow of water and how things happen in the wetlands. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me now? OK, public speaking makes me want to throw up, so bear with me. I will only ask one question, but I'm a little bit orientated. Can, can you scroll that up a little bit so we can see all those um, easement sector plan lands legend on the right, on the right, please? Because, you know, I'm used to looking at the Lafayette County maps, and these are Plum Creek's the only, the only one that's missing here promotional is, materials. This is agricultural, which is this land. That's all, all that's missing is that. OK. Um, well, like I said, I'm accustomed to looking at the county maps and the uh, proposals that have been submitted. And what's in purple there, am I not correct that that's been submitted as mixed use industrial? It's stated there in purple, which is very pretty. Employment oriented mixed use. But actually, isn't the proposal for mixed use industrial? Let me quickly say something from the county's perspective and I'll turn it over for an answer. Okay. No, it's not industrial. The industrial, my understanding, is going to be somewhere else, primarily. Okay. I stand corrected. It is, there is an industrial allowed. The mixed use, many of the things that they're proposing to do in their areas are good. They're good planning concepts. A mix of uses, clustering in appropriate areas, transferring density away from more environmentally sensitive areas, those are all good things. The point is, these are things that are already required in a comprehensive plan. We're not gaining anything. They're good basic planning concepts that Plum Creek would have to abide by if they're on the west side of the county trying to do something comparable. They would be required to do those things. So we're all in agreement. Clustering makes sense. Mixed use makes good sense. Those are good things. There's nothing new here. That's already the law. I'm not entirely sure who I'm talking to. So many people I'm never going to see again. And I live here. I know that. Uh, Commissioner Byerly, Ms. Wagler. Sir, who are you? Say it again. Oh, I'm going to follow up and read everything. And you're Mr. Jackson, you? Yeah. Okay. I'm Linda Shelley. Linda Shelley. Okay, great. Yes, I've read the work. Yes. You live in Tallahassee. <laughs> okay. Um, why on earth would we trust, like, these pages and pages of non statistics and pretty colored pieces of paper? when all you're going to do is sell the property to other people and see you later. Our fear is that this, what you got here in purple, which you're submitting, that's the new proposal for mixed-use industrial, that none of that is what you have any intention of doing. This, if the proposal is passed, you'll have the right to drill for oil and do whatever you damn well please. And that makes us mighty uncomfortable. Their train corridor running through 301, go through Plum Creek Lands West and ship our oil and gas right off someplace else. So we have great concerns about this. We, we're, we're, we're not going to go for oil on this. Well, then why are you spending all your time doing nothing but try to get oil and mineral and gas rights? I mean, that's Plum Creek's major thing these days. Yeah, I, 
I, re I don't know what you're talking about. I really don't. Right? Is anybody else Okay, with uh, regard to the define, defining conservation, uh, as uh, Mr. Byerly pointed out, uh, the approach to land use under conservation is short rotation, plantation, forestry, uh, which is ecologically uh, as depauperate as one could come across. Is there any possibility that Plum Creek would consider a major change in their approach to forestry that would be much closer to conservation? Because it is currently certified by the Sustainable Forest Initiative, which Forest Ethics calls a greenwash. Uh, it is not appreciated by the environmental community nationally, and it wouldn't be here locally. Uh, might you consider a different approach to forestry that is really uh, uh, akin to conservation? I guess that, that's a good question. And, and we would consider that on some of these lands, a different way of managing those lands on some of these lands, and look forward to a conversation with the commissioners in the hearing process to talk about what are the concerns about those practices. The, Sustainable Forestry Initiative is something that in, in other parts of the country, if you're saying it's not respected here in, in Alatro County, it is a respected uh, certification um, that exists. The lands that are in the county today that are under conservation easement are managed that way. And some of those lands, some of the Lacusa lands, have special areas where they have different forestry practices that we use we practice on those lands by virtue of those easements. And those are negotiated as a part of selling those easements. So that is something we would consider on some of these lands. He, he has a question about that. Just quickly, the, the certification, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but there are two different kinds of certifying practices. One is essentially industry derived. Plum Creek was one of the corporate players that helped develop the SFI standards. Environmentalists are extremely skeptical about them. The FSC, or Stewardship Council, standards are not industry derived or funded, and they have a lot more, care a lot more weight than that. I want to quickly point out one thing about this is the corridor line up through the middle of it where Plum Creek has promised to uh, set aside a thousand feet on either side of Black Lusa Creek. They made a statement I have to correct. And that is they said that the county only requires a 75 foot wide buffer on its weapons. Therefore, their thousand foot offer would provide more protection to that corridor. Technically, that's true, but it misses the larger story, which is that this land is all. Uh, Strategic ecosystem, as I mentioned earlier, that means half of the lands of the uplands that are strategic ecosystem would have to be conserved. So under the county's comprehensive plan, that's the most environmentally sensitive part, assuming that it is near the creek. You're going to wind up with a much wider wildlife corridor buffer along that creek under the county's comprehensive plan than what was indicated that city of five foot wide. We're, we're about to run out of time, so after these like, two ladies, we're going to have to close the questions. You, you've come before, right? What's, we met someone else, one other that has not been yet spoken yet. So we're going to end it with two, the last two because we're about out of time. I would like to say, as a member of the task force, for three years, we're, we're in our third year. I have served with some of the most responsible experts in the state of Florida on this task force. This has not been a setting job. This has been a job of us telling them what we would like to see as people who treasure our land. We've been in Windsor 50 years. I would not dare stand before anybody and give that away without knowing 
what their plan was. So I decided to join the plan and see if I could have a benefit of seeing how, how it was going to work, how it was going to serve us. And what we were going to, if Windsor was going to benefit or go down the tube from it. And let me tell you, if Windsor misses this opportunity or if Hawthorne misses this opportunity, they'll never get it again. Because as a, as a member of the Windsor community, we have never been offered anything that even comes near what this is to offer us more than a landfill. And Mike, I respect your position on the commission. I've seen you there for years, watched on television every week, or every two weeks. And, and it, gets, it gets hilarious at times. And now it's better than watching nines. But anyway, I want you to, I want you to answer a question for me. Um, the conservation easements that will go out. What would it take for our three commissioners not to be able to change that once it's in place? A conservation easement, as it's commonly understood, is perpetual. Once it is in place, it runs with the land and can never be changed. That's why the Not the land, not the land that has the easement on it, unless all parties agree to change it. There's a process where they can do it. Whoever owns the conservation easement will have the same as whether it's open or not. I just want you to explain all of you that they can't. The commission can't change, and there's nothing that has to be split all the time. I'll be happy to try. The part. The part that has a conservation easement on it, the way it's typically understood, it's not possible, it's virtually impossible. Once it's in place on the land, it's there forever. That is not, is not all the land that we're talking about. That is only the parts that Plum Creek is considering to put into conservation, not any of the part that they're proposing to develop in any kind of mixed use. When I say that can be changed on the vote of three county commissioners, that's the part I'm talking about. There's a process in place where they can come back in front of the county commission and request changes. It wouldn't be Plum Creek if we ever buy some land from them if they have a different plan than Plum Creek might have. It would be up to the future county commission. That is why it is so important to understand, if you care about the environment, what we mean by conservation. Again, if you're locking in place industrial forestry, it is highly debatable how much good that does the environment, how much good that does the wildlife. I welcome the suggestion from Plum Creek that they're willing to talk about modifying their forestry practices. If they're willing to do that substantially, that changes the discussion. That is not the impression I've gotten from my discussions with them so far. And I would invite them to point out the areas that are proposed for conservation that they're willing to consider having a discussion about substantially improving forestry practices. And if we can get the kind of deal where those practices really are beneficial to the environment and a conservation easement can lock them in place, that changes the discussion. But that's not what's on the table right now. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
considerably different than the maps we have that are our documents. But let's just go on. We're talking about here, right? This is the land around Hawthorne. This is area A. This is C, D, E. We're talking about these areas. That's Lockloosa Creek and the connection from Lockloosa Creek to, to Noonan's Lake Conservation Area. That's green in the proposal. We're talking about these areas. Those areas are, they are, they are right at, over in, in, in the numbers we have, about 30% of that land, there's 11,300 acres, about 30% of that land is wetland and wetland buffers. That's about what that is, 30%. It's a little higher down here, it's about 41% down here. Up here, it's in the 20% uh, area. So that's about what that is. So to develop on those lands, right, we're going to develop around, around as many of those wetlands as possible and not touch them. The plan that we have proposed says, let's look at one, look at spur, rail spurs to this railroad track. And if we need to impact wetlands to get rail spurs to go there, we should be allowed to consider that. We should be allowed to propose to the commission. Um, to put a mixed-use job center here, we might consider proposing some impacts of wetland. I just talked about it. Perhaps it's a few dozen, perhaps it's a couple hundred acres in that area. But the other development happens around those, not in the wetlands themselves. Okay, is that is it? Yes. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I guess that's pretty frightening to me. I, I have a sister who lives down in Bonita Springs. And when you see what's happened, well, GMC was a, a big company that came into Florida in the 50s. And get, Florida is such a transient state. There aren't a lot of people who have been around as long as, uh, and many people haven't been around as long as I was saying. But, um, the, the, the GMC Corporation came in and they created um, canals. They, they, they dredged and they moved around waterways and they completely, I mean, they ignored the natural flow of water, which I assume goes into La Cusa Lake from this area. Once you do that, uh, and how good you are at it, uh, you, you've opened up the door for the water to really act differently. And certainly in uh, Bonita Springs, it is the water in those channels is full of, of toxic bi uh, um, biomass. <laughs> well, um, it's toxic bacteria, basically. And, and in the summertime, it's floating dead material. It's, it's shocking. And this is you know, right near Naples, which is one of the fanciest places in the United States. But it, it really worries me that we would consider building in wetlands and taking a chance with dredging and building that we have learned from experience in Florida doesn't work in the long haul. And I believe you all are interested in the long haul as everybody else is here. Thank you very much. And can I quickly say, I did not produce this map. Our growth management staff with the county produced it. It's based upon water management district data that Plum Creek is required by law to use in their application. Same day. I, just, I think, um, Ms. Dickinson, you're talking about General Development Corporation, who developed a lot of places, Fort St. Lucie, Fort LaBelle, around the state of Florida, well before there were any environmental regulations. There was no requirement for water management at all. That's, those are the travesties that we have now have a lot of regulations in place that, to address stormwater management and to address credit building. So that's a long time here. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Plum Creek for coming here. Uh, my name is Tawana Bristow and uh, I've lived here for 60 years and my family, the Bristows, which are here, has been in uh, Hawthorne for over a hundred years. And uh, my children and my grandchildren are in this community and will grow up here. And they go to school here and have graduated here, so has my family's grandfathers and all the way back. And um, I'm not sure how many of some of the other people that are here and everything are from Hawthorne, have gone here to Hawthorne and grew up here. 
and taking concern of offline uh, because uh, our school, our community does need help. And I'm glad that y'all have taken uh, notice of the area and are coming in and helping because the county has not. For many years, our county, our Hawthorne, has gone downhill. Our kids have been dropping out of school from the high school. Our kids have been struggling uh, over here at Shell. We have been making uh, felon grades at uh, the elementary school and at the high school. Do any of y'all know that? Are you concerned about it? Then why aren't y'all here making a difference with any of that? I'm talking still. And so, I'm still talking. So, I'm glad that y'all were taking notice of it and our kids don't have, the, as they're dropping out of school, they do not have jobs. They are trying to get to school or go to Gainesville to get jobs. And so I'm glad that y'all are taking notice of what's going on, that we need help here. And I, yeah, I do trust y'all. I'm taking trust in y'all of being able to come out and help because our county hasn't helped. And so, like I said, I have been here for 60 years, and also my family has been here for over 100 years. And I don't know if there's anybody else that's been here that long or not. That's right, my brother-in-law. So anyhow, thank you, Plum Creek, for helping. All right. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you sitting there. Couldn't stand. No problem. I, I got no problem. My legs, you know. And I don't know if I'm pro or con to this, but I see where y'all made a lot of questions. You answered a lot of problems, but you're just not doing the problem. You know, now you're talking about how long this land was dry. Two years ago, it was dry. But well, we've been in a drought for the last five years. So two years ago, you could have walked on any swamp out there without getting your feet wet. Today, you can't do that. We need to protect that land. But we also need development. It's a two-way thing. You can't set steel. And that's been part of the problem with this town is they bought development. I'm not saying that this development is bad. I'm not going to sit here and say that these people are are standing on, you know, the, the wall to, to, they're here for us. They're a real estate company in the timber business. They're in the timber business. And to me, if I got land and I want to develop it, I think I ought to have a right to develop it. But you got to have guidelines. Now you say that, you know, we're going to zone this stuff to prove this, and then we're going to come back after that to decide about the water stuff. Well, why are we putting the horse or the trailer in front of the wagon? The horse. You know, let's, let's get everything approved. Let's go back to the drawing board and let's get everything approved. They're not going to develop this land. They're going to sell the land. Now, as a group of people, would we rather deal with one group of people that own the land now that they're shooting for the right zoning and I think we need to work on the zoning business, what we do on it, the environmental part, the whole thing. But, you know, we've got to protect the land, we've got to protect the people, we've got to provide jobs. And I'd a whole lot rather deal with a group that has taken the time to come out and talk to us about it. trying to work out and solve the problem. And let's get the problem solved, get the proper zoning. Now we're gonna we're gonna put this in this conversation down here on the spot ball. We've already done it. That gives you the right, you still own the land. They paid you not to develop. I know how that works. They're trying to do the same thing with my piece of right <laughs> And believe me, it ain't an easy piece of deal to deal with it. It's a 350 year plan. They call it a forever plan. 350 years is gonna be a lot. 
longer than any of us. That's for sure. Most of our children's children's children. You know. But there's, there's all kinds of different plans on that. So why not get this zone and figure out what we're going to do? Now everybody's talking about the water run off the cliff. That water don't stay on that land anyway. I mean, it runs off. Where does it go? It goes to the lower part of the land. But we're not talking about these people making these decisions. I mean, you've got St. John the Water Manager. You've got the Environmental Protection Agency. They want protection on every rainfall that gets in place. I know exactly what I'm talking about. I deal with the farmers. I'm on the Cattlemen's Association. And we're dealing with this all the time, you know, with these agencies. But these people got to go by guidelines. It's up to the county commission. And, you know, if we don't do nothing else, do like the Cattlemen did or the state university. And all these to come up with best management practices. You have a best management practice for forest, I know. We have a best managed practice for cattle operations, for row crop operations. They're the best managed practice. These were developed by one or two people. It was through water management, EPA, university, and a lot of other organizations that sat down and say, this is the way we think it needs to be done legally. And if you do it this way, then we try to keep the rest of the people off your back. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. But you need to, as commissioners, you know, tighten this thing up on the on the zone and, and not not worry about you know having set it in concrete you know that they're going to develop this this is the way it's going to be through the development uh, not you know 10 years 20 years down the line where it's going to be right. i know everybody nobody wants to see 10,000 houses across their back door i don't either all right thank you, you, Mr. Mr. Yeah, thank you Mr. <laughs>